what what do you want to say now um, <coughs> the bride and her bachelor's hot air Bird's Dance, Chapter 1 Wednesday, 14th of October, 2017 At the edge of a forest one and a half times the size of Europe sat an ostrich hen. It was sitting on its nest. The ostrich was vaguely aware that this was not its normal habitat, but it would do. Behind the ostrich, a reindeer trod quietly over dry birch leaves. It was not aware that this was its normal habitat. A wolf padded even more quietly between the slender silver birch. It did not know or care whether this was its normal habitat. The ostrich caught sight of the wolf in the distance and lowered its head. 
but did not bury it, as commonly supposed by man for thousands of years. A man approached the three-metre-wide ostrich nest from the edge of the forest. He did not expect the ostrich to bury its head. Therefore, he was not surprised when it didn't. He didn't know what an ostrich was. The wolf was moving counterclockwise, as all wolves do, but didn't know it. It was looking for a meal for its whelps. The ostrich ate anything except large animals, due to its beak size and lack of teeth, not to mention three million years of evolutionary adaptation since its debut appearance in the Pliocene era, when life forms were all quite different after the much duller Miocene era. The wolf could devour most animals, but always left their stomachs out. Out of instinct and common courtesy. It also ate grass when it felt like it to help with its digestion. The man could have eaten all of them, but was looking for bilberries. He had never been to the edge of the forest before and was impressed by the view across the grasslands. 37,000 feet away, other people were trying to find the slots for their seat belts before the plane began its precipitous descent. One unwittingly dropped something down the toilet in the hurry to get back to his seat. He was in a trade delegation from Ecuador to Otkotsk in Siberia. The man at the edge of the forest looked up at the thin silvery clouds widening across the sky. He wasn't quite sure what they were, and because this was his first time out of the forest, he now realised how long they were and how the little crystal made them grow. He had always thought that he had no need to visit the Russian town like the others, to learn their ways. He could work things out for himself. He knew his ways were better. The brilliant sienna birch leaves tumbled through the cobalt sky at each suggestion of wind. The wolf decided that it wanted to kill the reindeer. Science was no object. It could drag half the carcass back to its whelps. This was less work than gorging 18 pounds of meat, then regurgitating. Metaphorically, it was fed up to the back teeth with regurgitation. It preferred the newfangled dragging method, but was not quite sure why. The reindeer had its head lowered near the roots of a silver birch by a stream. It was eating the moss unthinkingly. The wolf approached downwind. It loped at its customary 15 miles per hour, which gave it the best fuel efficiency. Teeth bared, ready for attack. The man was part of the second brigade of the Evenk people and had an untiring taste for bilberries, which was just as well because apart from fungi and reindeer, that was all there was most of the time. It didn't bother him because he never really thought about it. His birch bark clad foot stepped forward onto a particular sort of birch twig, long dried by the winds from the tundra, which gave a very loud crack. He looked down in amazement. The reindeer looked up in curiosity. At just the moment the wolf was less than a wet nose away from severing the reindeer's spinal cord, and in doing so, punctured the belly of the wolf with its remaining right antler, having lost the left in his last rut. This had greatly confused it and the other reindeer. It had won the rut, possessed the largest single antler, and due to an earlier incident with a younger wolf, was effectively castrated. It felt that it knew its place in the herd. That was at the top. It acted as though this was the case. That would surely be good enough. 
When it returned to the herd with a wolf in the early stages of rigor mortis impaled on its antler, it sensed that the other reindeer would give him the respect that he craved. The wolf's ribcage was lodged obstinately on the other side of an antler branch junction. As the reindeer walked amongst its herd, the antler finally gave way under the strain of 50 kilograms of stiff wolf. The reindeer now had no antlers or testicles. Things carried on as usual. The early morning sun was rising, picking out the small drifts of mist lying on the grassland near the lake. Next to a lone tussock of grass sat an irregular block of ice about the same size. The trapped bubbles within sparkled in the morning sun. A grey block trilled feebly in the ice. Coloured light flickered from it and it began to vibrate. The Evenk tribesman padded amongst the bilberries, scooping at them with his birch basket. He looked up out of the forest for an instant to take in the grasslands beyond once more. A large feathery silhouetted form caught his eye. The ostrich was lowering its two foot long neck and pecking viciously at the ground. The claw on the end of its foot got caught in something which further infuriated it. The bird started to hop clumsily around. The man drew nearer to the ostrich. From the edge of the trees he could see the exposed nest site. It was a shallow circular mud pit with seven eggs inside, each about 15 centimetres long. The eggs would make an inspired change from bilberries, he thought. As he gently approached the nest, the ostrich was preoccupied with a block of ice stuck on the end of its solitary left claw. It brought its beak down on the ice with a speed that gave it mild concussion. The ice was now deeply fractured, and when the ostrich came round, it delivered a decisive blow which split the ice open. The ostrich swallowed the mobile phone. As the top passed its beak, the lid catch was depressed, and the screen popped up as it slid down its throat. The phone lodged obstinately one third of the way down. A polyphonic trilling warbled at loud volume from the bird's mouth. Much further away across the grassland, one of the ostrich cocks involved in the polygamous breeding procedure lifted its head a millimetre higher. It sensed that things weren't right, so it ran at 40 miles an hour back to the nest. At the nest, the event tribesman had just managed to fit all the eggs into his basket, except one which he carried in his hand.